if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn to Luke's Gospel. It's really not Luke's, it's the Gospel according to Luke. Uh, it's chapter 14, and our verses this morning are verses 1 through 6. Kind of set the stage here a little bit. Jesus, in this passage again, is showing us about three things. He's showing us, first of all, uh, the something of the heart of those who oppose his ministry. And he's showing us something about his own heart. And then thirdly, he's showing us something about how our hearts should respond to the Lord's day. Jesus here in this text in verses 1 through 6, Jesus is instructing us that the way that we, serve, we observe the Lord's day is an indicator, beloved. Listen, hear these words. It is an indicator of our spiritual condition. And it is an indicator of the state of our own hearts within us. And especially it reveals whether we have by the Holy Spirit and by God's grace been conformed to the heart of God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning from this passage, I want us to see how Luke shows us, number one in your outline, the difference between Jesus and the Pharisees and in the state of their heart. In this passage, Luke gives us a picture of a man who has experienced suffering and serious illness for a long time. And notice this. Notice how Luke tells us that this man was in front of them. Okay? He is in front of him. He's in front of who? In front of Jesus. But think of this. We have this picture of Jesus at this leader of the Pharisees' home. Now, you know there's other Pharisees there, maybe even some of the Sadducees. Jesus is the middle of this gathering, and there's Pharisees around him, and there in front of him is this man in terrible need who is suffering. But let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer because I'm going to give you the answer. I wish I had those kind of questions back when I was in school. But where are the Pharisees' eyes? Luke tells us at the end of verse 1, they are watching him closely. Who are they watching closely? The man in need? No. Honestly, they probably don't even care about that guy. They're watching Jesus, and they're watching Jesus not out of reverence, not out of respect. They're not watching Jesus because they're just hanging on to every single syllable of a word that falls from the lips of Almighty God. They're not doing that. And they're not watching Jesus as if they are ready to obey every single one of his commands that he possibly gives at this point. But they are watching him because they suspect him. They didn't, for lack of better words, they didn't trust his teachings. They didn't trust his teachings or his practices, and especially on the issue of the Sabbath day. You'll remember that Jesus had been criticized by this same group because of his practice of healing on the Sabbath day. So now on another Sabbath day, in the middle of this meal, because you remember Jesus went there to eat bread, that's a meal. He looks at them and he asks them a question. And he asks them a very, really a very general question. Here it is. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now, before they don't answer, Jesus knew what was on their minds. And I have to tell you this morning, beloved, Jesus knows what's on your mind. I always think back and you know I'm going to tell this story. I always think back 
to when Joseph and Mary are betrothed. Mary is pregnant. Joseph, even though he's a righteous man, he knows it's not his child. So his same assumption is that Mary has been unfaithful to him. And he's mauling over in his own mind. None of his buddies are there. Nobody. He's mauling it over in his mind what to do with her because she's been unfaithful. And again, he knows it's not his child. And the angel of the Lord says, Joseph, don't be afraid. Beloved, listen, if the Lord knew what Joseph was mauling over in his mind without saying a word, if Jesus here in this midst of these Pharisees knew what was on their mind, let me guarantee you Jesus knows what's on your mind. All right? But here in Luke, he knows what's on their mind, because it's a regular point of conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees. And they didn't like what he did not do in the areas of the Sabbath or in other areas. And that he did not teach or enforce his disciples to practice the traditions of the elders. So they say nothing. But here's the thing, beloved. The traditions of the elders are not found in the Hebrew scriptures, are they? They're not found in the Torah. They're not found in the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They're not found in the law of Moses. Well, where in the world are they found? They're found in a misinterpretation and expansion of the Hebrew scriptures for ethical and ceremonial ordinances by these men right here. And beloved, Jesus didn't enforce those traditions on his disciples and he came regularly into conflict with the Pharisees because the Pharisees thought that a good God-fearer, a good Jewish person, should follow those traditions. Now, as students of the Bible, you know that some of the things that set them apart in their religious things, wasn't it? These traditions. Some traditions are okay, but they're not from God. Tradition kills. The Spirit gives life. You can't follow traditions. So they're watching Jesus closely to see whether he is once again going to violate not the commandment of God, but the commandment of man. Commandment of man as part of the tradition of the elders, which they highly value. And oh, by the way, which Jesus says that they are illegitimate additions to the word of God. So again, he asked them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And again, notice that Luke tells us they kept silent. Let me ask you this, or maybe it's just the way I, I'm getting wired. Have you ever thought why they were silent? Well, if you haven't, I'll be glad to tell you why. These guys couldn't point to a single verse or word in the law of Moses that would forbid or forbid the healing of a person on the Sabbath. Not one verse of the Hebrew scriptures would place a ban on Jesus healing this man. Who, by the way, is the Lord of glory, healing someone on the Sabbath or anyone being healed on the Sabbath. They had no place to run to. And yet the Pharisees believed that Jesus' ministerial practice 
sold out the Sabbath tradition. So they were locked on him, and yet when the Lord challenged these religious leaders, is it right or is it wrong, nobody speaks up. And the reason why is because they can't. They can't quote scripture. Now this is important because Jesus isn't saying what the Bible says about the Sabbath is not important. It is. But what man says about the Sabbath or the Lord's day, that's not important. Let's stick with the word of God. Amen. And the Lord is saying you have added to the Bible. Therefore, by adding to the Bible, you have diminished the authority of of the word of God. And Jesus makes it clear beloved. That our place for the final spiritual authority. In our faith. In our daily practice. Is found in the word of God. Not in traditions of man. Not in the addition that people come up with. However religious the ideas sound. And some people can have come up with a lot of. Ideas that really sound religious, but they're not. Or whatever the motivation for their coming up with those extra things are. And let me add this in. And don't miss this, please. These extra things that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and some people in the church add in are self-centered and are sinful. We are not to burden people with extra added commandments. God gave ten and we can't even keep one of them. And so folks, I also want us to see how Luke uncovers to us, and this is number two. And this is kind of a long way of putting it. But I thought it fit. The warped range of values that exist among these Pharisees. And they are warped, are they not? Notice that as this man is in front of them, and notice this guy, he's not just a normal guy. He's not a healthy guy. He's suffering. And they're not looking at this guy or even thinking about this guy. And like I said earlier, I think that myself personally, studying the Pharisees and the Sadducees and who all those guys were, they could have cared less about this guy. And it's clear that after Jesus heals him in verse 4, where it says he took hold of him, boy, there was something right there. Right? Because why? The guy was sick. He takes hold of him and heals him and sends him away. And next, Jesus asks a question, and again in verse 5. And he said to them, which, of, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And look what we hear in verse 6. And they could make no reply to this. And why couldn't they reply? I think it's the reason is a little different than the first time. The reason was because they didn't have a heart of mercy. They didn't have a heart of mercy for this guy. Now the Pharisees, they did have a category in their law. Now listen to this. They had a category in their law that allowed them to help an ox out of a ditch on the Sabbath day. A dumb, big, burly, block-headed ox. Did I describe it? Okay. And they could even quote the Hebrew scriptures on that. That they, hey, we've got the right. The dumb ox fell in the ditch. We can pull him out. So they could allow for that kind of necessary care of a domestic animal within their Sabbath code of laws. But their hearts were not moved with compassion 
when they looked at this guy who was standing before them and Jesus who was suffering. What Luke is doing is this. He is showing us their hearts. Because how in the world could you think that God who makes allowance for kind treatments to a dumb ox who had somehow fell in a ditch that he wouldn't care for a human person who was created in his image. What Luke is showing us here, beloved, is number three, the contrast in the heart of Jesus and the Pharisee. I'm going to state this correctly. The Pharisees were making a big hoorah about how much care they had for religious observance. Did you like that? That hoorah? But they didn't care about a person made in the image of God who was in need and was suffering. But Jesus shows us a deep concern and compassion toward this man and show, by showing him mercy. Now, sometimes in some of my messages, I ask questions, right? I'm going to ask a silly question. How do you like that? Between Jesus and the Pharisee, who is in fact honoring the commandments of God on the Lord's day? And just in case you're wondering, the answer is Jesus, okay? After all, the Lord's Day in the Hebrew Scripture, you ready for this, is rooted in what? It's rooted in God's mercy. How do I know that? Well, if, if you recall back in Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20 is given to whom? It's given to a, a nation of redeemed slaves, right? In other words, God has brought a nation of slaves out of Egypt who for, for 430 years had been enslaved and their time did not belong to themselves. They were captive to other people. And in Mount Sinai, that's where Exodus 20 is, God said to them in valley paraphrase, now here's how it's going to be. From now on, you're going to have one day in seven to rest. Or if you didn't understand that, one day out of the seven, you don't have to go to work. Now, let me ask you a question. How do you think a slave who had worked seven out of seven days and now receives a day off from work, how do you think that former slave would respond? Praise God. Well, yes, you should. Okay? But they would think, you mean to tell me we get one day off? Beloved, that is a picture of God's mercy to them and to many of his laws. Amen? Which God gave to Moses. And the Sabbath day was designed to make sure that having received the mercy from God, those who were in, in position of privilege and power did not take advantage of the least of the brethren or the other servants who might be made to work on the Lord's day while the rest of the family enjoyed the rest. I've been there. I've had jobs. You've had jobs where your boss looked at you and said, you will work Sunday. Did you like it? No. Did you do it anyway? Yes. Why? Because it was your job. And nobody should look down on the brother or the sister who has to work on, the, on Sunday, what we call Sunday, the Lord's Day, because his or her boss says, you've got to go to work. So the whole of, of God's law was meant to make sure that the Sabbath day was a day of blessing for all his people. 
So those who are shown God's mercy and reminded of that mercy on the Sabbath day are meant to be merciful to, to show mercy to others. Now there are some things that we, we, need, we are to learn. And one of the things we learn from this is this, is that showing mercy is always right. Amen? We should never, ever, listen to my words, we should never, ever use the excuse of religious observance to exempt us from showing mercy. Just because somebody has to work on Sunday doesn't mean that you or I are any better than they are. Their jobs just call for it. One of the things that the Hebrew Scripture prophets repeatedly said, and our Lord says it as well in his teaching, is to obey is better than sacrifices. Or to sum it up, to love mercy, do justly, and walk humbly with your God. Amen? That's what we're to do, folks. It's not merely ceremonial observances. And the Pharisees were using ceremonial observances as an excuse not to show mercy. But they could to that dumb ox. But not this poor Israelite. And beloved, if we're not careful, we can fall into that too, can't we? Even though we're not under the ceremonial law anymore, we can still use religious observance to exempt us from having a heart of mercy. The Hebrew prophets and Jesus both made it clear that our ethical conduct is more important than ceremonial observances. And the Lord demonstrates this in the account of the Good Samaritan, does he not? Remember that story? You had this priest, you had this Levi, and when they come along the road from Jericho and see the man who was wounded because he had been beaten up and left for dead by a bunch of robbers, the priest and Levi, they don't even go and help the guy. Why not? Well, the students of the Bible, you know, because if, if the ceremonial law was broken, if they touched that guy because they thought he was dead or wounded, then they would become ceremonially unclean and they wouldn't be able to participate in the temple service. And in the account, who does Jesus commend? None other but a Samaritan who came along, not only looked at him, helped him up on his own beast, a burden, the donkey, and helped the man and took him to a place where he could be restored to his strength and health and even paid for him to be taken care of. In other words, Jesus was making it clear that no concern for ceremonial cleanliness can trump the ethical demand for showing mercy to others. And of course, that's something that the prophets taught in the Hebrew scriptures. And it's not something new to Jesus. He's just emphasizing it. And he demonstrates it in his life. Now here's the thing that I thought was great. And if you miss anything, don't miss this, okay? Okay. If we were to look up the word Sabbath in a concordance of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then if we were to look at every passage about the Sabbath that described what Jesus did on the Sabbath, we would find over and over again that Jesus did mainly three things on the Sabbath. And I know they're not in your outline, but you are to write them down, so I'm going to say them slowly. First of all, he worshipped. Amen? He worshipped God on the Sabbath day. Number two, Jesus showed mercy to others on the Sabbath day. We're seeing it right here. We've seen it before. And number three, Jesus gave permission to his disciples to do deeds what are called deeds of necessity on the Sabbath day. 
And I think that those things tell us the way that we are to look at the Lord's day. Amen? When it is Sunday, because that's the day that we consider the Lord's day. Right? Why? Because the Lord rose on the first day of the week. What's the first day of the week? Sunday. We're in church on Sunday. We're here at church on Sunday to worship Almighty God. And if we're not here to worship God on Sunday morning, then we don't need to be here. Because you're being a hypocrite. And you're sinning just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the elders did. Beloved, Jesus cared about the Lord Day and he cared about it a lot and so should we. We don't add to it. We don't take away from it. But we come to church on the Lord's Day to worship God and only God. And God's word was the rule of how we observe the Lord's Day. Now, in closing, I want us to look at two things briefly. If we're going to follow Jesus' example and attitude toward the Lord's Day, I've hit this drum once before. Now I'm going to hit one string guitar. We will love to worship God. And we will love to worship with God's people. I believe that when you have received the mercy of God, and how many of us have received the mercy of God? Every single hand ought to go up if you're a child of God. We should love to get with our brothers and sisters in Christ who have been shown mercy of God and to sing praises to God for his mercy for your life and my life. And I think those who are growing in their faith love to gather and worship the one true and living God. And just in case you wonder who that one true living God is, his name is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord provides. His name is Jehovah Shalom. The Lord of peace or the God of peace. Jehovah Rapha. The Lord is my shepherd. Elohim. Powerful God. And then Yahweh. Israel's covenant God. And we do that, beloved, through Yeshua. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Beloved, is that, that is one way that I believe as followers of Jesus Christ, when we walk into this place on Sunday morning, this is the attitude that we have. And again, if we don't, we're no different than the Pharisees. The second thing is this, to show mercy. Jesus' uh, action used on the Lord's day is an illustration that our Lord was always about the purpose of mercy, was it not? And folks, the Lord's Day for us is a day of mercy. Because it reminds us of the day of Jesus' resurrection. That's why we're here on Sunday. He, and I know this isn't grammar, grammarly correct, but he resurrected. He rose from the dead. Not on Friday, not on Saturday. He rose on Sunday. And when you and I come here, we celebrate and we worship his mercy by coming from the grave. Because if he didn't come from the grave victoriously, folks, it wouldn't be a one of us here today. We'd all be at home, a bed, sleep, or maybe drunk, stoned, in our sin, on the fast track to hell. And because he rose from the dead and what he accomplished for us, that gives us our hope 
and our confidence of our resurrection as we trust in him. One day I'm going to die. Some doctor somewhere along the line is going to take my pulse and he's going to go, he doesn't have one. And they've got me strapped to this little machine and that line's going to go straight across. And the doctor's going to look who's at, ever in that room with him and he says, I now pronounce him dead. <laughs> yeah, don't believe it. I'm more alive then than I am right now standing before you. Okay? And the same is true for you. And I will raise from the dead. And if I die before you, I'm going first. Yeah. You can follow me. But if you die before me, I'll follow you. And that gives us confidence. Amen? I don't have to worry about when my loved ones die that they're stuck in the ground and they're just going to be there forever. No. If they know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, they're going to heaven. Their bod bodily resurrection is coming out. The soul's already in heaven with God. Amen? And that gives me peace. That gives me assurance. And sometimes in this old crazy world, I don't know which one I want first, death or rapture. I really don't. But the Lord's day is a day of rest. And it's a day of gladness. And it's a day of celebration. It's a day of giving Jehovah God our best. And to honor him and to worship him. And I'm excited about that. I don't know if you can tell that. But I want to worship God. I want to worship the one true living God. Through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Father, we pray that if we've truly been born again, born from above, not gone through traditions, but we have truly been called by you and we've ran to you and cried to you for, and begged you to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And because you've drawn us, you've done it. We just need to be obedient. Father, help us to worship you. Help us to worship you on the Lord's Day, Sunday, gathering together with brothers and sisters in Christ. But we can also worship you the other six days. But it's just something a little extra, Father, when we can come with true believers and worship you. Father, I pray that you speak to hearts. And if you're drawing people, draw them to you, Father God. And for those of us that have been drawn, help us to really know how to worship you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jehovah Shalom. The Lord, our God, in whose name we pray, amen.